This week, we're going to go over the GridView UI component in the Playday SDK. GridView is a component that allows you to easily create a grid of cells, like menus and lists. It handles navigating between cells, dynamically animating the scrolling, and more. Let's get right into it. First, before we do anything, you're going to need to import the timer and UI libraries. Since GridView relies internally on timers, you need to make sure to call update timers in the update function. We can start off by creating a new GridView object by calling ui.gridview.new. This constructor takes in two values, the width and height of each cell. On the grid, that's these two measurements. For this example, I'll just create it with a cell size of 32 by 32. Next, we'll need to instantiate a bunch of aspects of the grid. First, Let's set how many columns we want the grid to have. We can do that with the set number of columns method. I'll set it to eight for this example. Then we can set the number of rows using the set number of rows method. I'll set it to six. In order to actually start drawing the grid to the screen, we need to go over the update function and call the draw in rect method. This defines the region to draw the grid. That's this part of the grid view. The method takes in four values. The first two are the X and Y values of the top left of the region. And the next two are the width and height. I want to place the grid somewhere in the middle of the screen, so I'll set the arguments like so. If we go ahead and run this, you'll notice a few things. First, the grid is made up of these squares, which is the default style for the cells. Second, the top left square is colored in, which indicates the currently selected cell. And lastly, the grid gets cut off. That's the expected behavior, since we define the size of the grid in our draw and rec method, and it's smaller than the size necessary to fit all of our cells. But it looks a little weird without a border. I'll go ahead and address all of these points. Let's say we don't want to have squares, but something custom instead. We can change how the cells are drawn by overriding the draw cell method, like so. The draw cell method has a whopping eight arguments, which give information about what cell it's currently trying to draw. Let's draw a circle instead, which we can do by calling draw circle in rect with the x, y, width, and height passed in. If we run this, you can see circles now, but there's two issues. One, the circles are squeezed close together, and two, we can no longer tell which cell is selected. We can fix the first issue by drawing the circle smaller, or you can add padding to each of the cells by using the set cell padding method. This takes in four arguments, the left, right, top, and bottom padding respectively. I'll add two pixels of padding to each side. To fix the second issue, we can use the selected argument. This is set to true if the cell currently being drawn is a selected cell. If this is true, we can draw a filled circle instead and a regular circle otherwise. If we run this, you can see that these two issues are now addressed. In many cases, you probably want to draw some text in each cell. You can do that by simply calling the draw text in rect function. I'll create a string containing the row and column of the cell and draw that in. If we run this, there are two issues. One is the text is not vertically centered, and two, we can't see the text in the selected cell. There are many different ways to fix this, but I'll show you what I would do. In the draw cell method, I'll change the draw mode based on if the cell is selected or not. Next, I'll get the height of the font we're using and offset the Y position by the height divided in half subtracted by the font height divided in half. The system font itself isn't vertically centered, so I'll offset it by additional two pixels. The issues are now resolved. The cells look fine now, but what if we want to navigate between the different cells? Let's do that next. You can use button callbacks, but in this example, I'll just use some conditionals and check if buttons are being pressed. If we're pressing up, we can use a select previous row method to select a previous row. This takes in one argument, which is whether or not we should wrap around when we hit the end of the grid. I'll set this to true. I'll call the select next row method for when we press down. We can do the same thing for left and right by calling select previous column and select next column. I'll pass in false to make this not wrap as an example. If we run this, however, you'll notice that we get smearing if we try to move. This is caused by the grid not being cleared every frame. One solution to this is to simply draw a white rectangle behind the grid every frame. Personally, I would probably put the grid into a sprite instead, so let's do that. First, I'll import the sprite library and call the sprite update function. Then I'll create a new sprite and move it to be in the same position as where we wanted to draw the grid, and I'll add it to the draw list. Then in the update function, I'll create a new image in the size of our grid. Call push context on that image, draw the grid, but this time from the origin pop the context, and set the sprite image to our new image. Now, when we run this, you can see that we no longer have any smearing. If you remember how we set the grid wrapping to be true vertically, you can see how that works here. Since we set it to be false horizontally, the grid doesn't wrap when we move left or right. What if we wanted to use the crank to navigate the grid? That can be achieved pretty easily using the get crank ticks function. First, let's make sure to import the crank library. Then we can call get crank ticks to check what direction the crank is being turned. I'll pass in two to get an input twice every full turn. If crank ticks is one, then we can call select next row. If crank ticks is negative one, we'll call select previous row. The crank can now be used to move up and down the grid. 
we still have the issue of the grid being randomly cut off and looking weird. To fix that, we'll add a border to the grid. We'll do that with something called a 9 slice. A 9 slice is something that allows you to take a single image of an example background and stretch it out to any size. Let me give an example. So here I have an image of a background. It doesn't really matter what size it is because what we want to do is slice this background into 9 sections. That's the 4 corners, the 4 sides, and the center. What you would need to do is to simply designate what the center of the 9 slice will be, since you can extrapolate what the other 8 sections will be from just the dimensions of the centerpiece. For this one, that's roughly a rectangle that starts 7 pixels down and 7 pixels to the right with a width and height of 18. I'll then go to my code and first import the 9 slice library. Then, I'll create a new 9 slice with the path to my background image, the coordinates of the top left corner of the center slice, as well as the width and height of the center slice. If we run this, we can see that our background has been automatically stretched to the size of a grid. We do have one small issue, which is the border is overlapping some cells. You could just tweak the dimensions of the 9 slice, or you can add some inner padding by calling the setContentInsent method. I'll add a padding of 5 pixels on every side, and you can see now that our border is looking proper. One thing I haven't mentioned yet is the use of sections. With the grid view, you can actually create separate sections with different headers. We can define separate sections by passing in a list of rows instead of a single number to the setNumberOfRows method. You can see here I'm creating three sections. The first with two rows, the second with five, and a third with three rows for a total of 10 rows. If we run this, you'll see that the row numbers are being reset at each section, but it's not really obvious where the section breaks are. We can draw headers by first setting the section header height using set section header height, which I'll set to 24, and then overriding the section header draw function. I'll just draw some text centered in the section heading, like so. If we run this, you can see now that each of the sections are labeled. Next, I want to go over how you can make a simple list, like this one. We can switch out a few things. First. For the grid view constructor, if you pass in 0 to be the width, the cells will expand to fill up the width of the grid, which is ideal for a list. You don't need to set the number of columns as it defaults to 1. I'll also use this as an opportunity to show you how you can use data in your grids. I've created an array with values I want in the list. I can set the number of rows to be the length of the list to allow it to dynamically change with the data. Then, in the draw function, for the text, we can use the row number as an index into the array. I'll change the drawing of the cell to be a little different as well as remove horizontal navigation in the update function. And our grid now looks like this list. If you want to get data for a grid with both rows and columns, you might want to look into multi-dimensional arrays. If we highlight screen updates, you'll notice that the grid is constantly being redrawn. This can have performance implications causing your game to lag, especially if the grid takes up a large part of your screen. To combat this, we can use a handy property that exists on the grid view object called needs display. This is only true when the grid needs to be redrawn. If we wrap our draw call in a conditional that checks needs display, you'll see that the grid only updates when we're changing something. Outside of what I covered in this video, there are a few more customizable elements of the grid view, like adding horizontal dividers plus methods and properties to adjust the scroll behavior, which I'll leave as an exercise to you to investigate if you so choose. If you thought this video was helpful, consider subscribing as I'm making Playdate content every single week. Or you might want to check out this playlist with all of my Playdate SDK tutorials. Thanks, and see you next time.